Today we're going to look at the inner workings of the Flemish bells. But before we do that, it'll be helpful to spend a few minutes on the mechanics of sound and bell acoustics. When we hear musical sounds, even single notes, although we're seldom aware of it, we're actually hearing a whole range of frequencies at the same time. This is because when objects vibrate, they do so not only as a whole, but also in smaller parts, halves and thirds and quarters and so on, and each smaller segment that's vibrating emits a tone of its own. Those tones can be called harmonics or overtones or partial tones, and the series in which they fall is called the harmonic series. What you see here is a harmonic series starting on bass clef C. This series would be present in most acoustic instruments, and the difference in tone between different instruments would simply be the strength or weakness of the various harmonics. And by the way, they go on way further than this chart shows. Bells are unique in that they have an overtone series which doesn't follow the natural harmonic series at all. In bells that are cast as decorative objects, the overtones are totally random. There's no control exerted over them whatsoever. In a carillon bell, the bell is actually shaped carefully to generate a series of overtones that works well for the sound of the bell and also when the bells are in harmony. So if we start with a bell sounding middle C, that would be the strike tone or the note that we identify as the bell's pitch, the overtones will be like this. You'll have an E flat above that C, a minor third, that's a very key part of the bell sound, a fifth an octave above the strike note, an octave below the strike note. And that's a really important thing. That reinforces the sound of the strike note, gives a very definite sense of pitch to the bell. There's also a series of tones up here, an E natural, a G. There would be a high C. Sometimes that tends to be a little toward a C sharp, but not quite. So those would be the overtones in a carillon bell. When Schoenberg set out to make electronic carillon instruments, this is of course the pre-digital era, there was really no way to simulate a bell sound except take some kind of acoustical tone source, strike it, and amplify it. So they used fixed free rods, rods that are clamped on one end and free on the other. And when you strike a fixed free rod, you get a partial series something like this. We'll use middle C again. You would get an E flat above the middle C, which is again a very key bell sound. You also get another E flat an octave below this minor third. So the minor sound in those rods is very strong. You get a C up above, a G up here, sometimes some other overtones up above that really weren't worked with much. But that minor third gave enough of an impression that it sounded like a bell, even though it didn't have the precise series of overtones one would need. Notice this octave between the two minor thirds. That's really important. And uh, Schomerich later on discovered a way of using that octave. We'll see that in a moment. So Schomerich's early instruments, while they were suggestive of the sound of bells, didn't quite have the characteristics of a carillon bell because they were missing a key ingredient. They didn't have the hum tone falling an octave below the strike. And at the time, there just was no way known of making a, a metal rod produce that hum tone. So let's take a look at Schulmerich's patent for Flemish bells and see how they cleverly got around this problem. Here's the illustration from the patent. The first column, marked Carillon Bell, displays the same overtone series we looked at a moment ago. The next two columns are labeled Rod A and Rod B, and the patent explains that for this instrument, each note will be produced by two rods being tuned to different pitches and struck at the same time. By placing the pickups at carefully pre-selected points along the rod's length, certain overtones can be eliminated from the sound of the rod so that only those that are needed are generated. That rod B, having two overtones an octave apart, provides the much sought after hum tone and that is what makes Schulmerich Flemish bells able to sound so much more like carillon bells than any of the other electromechanical bells that were made anywhere around their time. The final column does show the composite overtone structure from the two rods, and it has all but one of the partials necessary for a good carillon bell. 
I said before that Schulmerich had found a way of making use of this octave, and it's in the rod B that we see in the patent. The discovery was this. This strike note that we hear in the rod actually isn't there on its own. It's a difference tone between these two partials up here. And our ears create that C that we hear as the note, the pitch of the rod. So what Schulmerich found is if you took this partial out by placing the pickup at a node, that would eliminate not only that partial, but this partial. And what you're left with is two notes an octave apart, and then a major third above that, an octave and a major third above the upper partial. So three partials, an octave, and then a tenth. And this is how Schulmerich got its hum tone out of the B rods. So if we were to take this same series of partials and start it on a different pitch, for example, if we had a minor third that was a C, we would also get a C down here, and we would get an E natural up here. And that compares exactly to the B rods in the Schulmerich patent. It's brilliant. This illustration shows a single note on the carillon. You can see the two rods parallel to one another. There are spring stabilizers, which connect to the rods at various points, uh, number 36 and 39, you can see those. Uh, those keep the rods from wobbling when they're struck. The little collars on the rods, like number 68, are weights that help to tune to bring the overtones into exact relationship. And the rods are mounted in a block, and that block at the bottom rests on rubber footings to help the uh, sound not get dampened unnecessarily. These are the Flemish cabinets. Each cabinet houses an octave of bells and has its own specially tuned preamp designed to emphasize the proper frequencies for that range of notes. Here's the inside of octave three, the middle octave. Uh, lowest note here is the C sharp above middle C and it goes to the third space C in the treble staff. You can see some of the elements that appeared in the patent drawings here. Uh, the rods obviously are in pairs, and if I zoom in up near the top of the of the shorter rod, you can see the two springs, which are the stabilizer. That keeps the rod from wobbling back and forth after it's struck, so that you don't get a lot of extraneous variations in the signal. At the top of each rod, there's a little cap, and you can see a little wire hanging from it. That is part of the tuning process, uh, in that that cap can be adjusted up and down. It's actually threaded onto the rod, and then the little wire that hangs through is a damper to control the amount of ring time produced by that rod. The yellow plastic that you can see is the holder for the, the collector plates or the pickups. You can see that's kind of a flat, almost staple-shaped wire that runs alongside the, uh, the back portion of the rod, very close to it. More stabilizers down toward the bottom. And all of those wires which come forward from behind the rods are going from the pickups to a common wire that then goes into the amplifier input. Down at the bottom you can see a row of barrel shaped coils. Those are the coils for the strikers. So here we are behind octave three. You can see the vertical bars that support the rods and also the block at the bottom where the number is. And notice that those are resting on rubber footings which I need to go through and replace those. I've replaced some of them, but there are more that need to be done. If you saw the initial video where I gave the overview of the carillon, I mentioned that each tone generator has a signature or initials on it. So you can see here the initials of the people who worked on these, which I think is just such a cool thing. I wonder if any of those people are still with us. I have the instrument set up to reiterate a single note 
using the tremolando unit on the console, which that's a topic for a future video. Anyway, what I'm going to do is start that note sounding, and then I'll pull the input tubes out uh, for the A section and B section of the amplifier, so you can hear the contribution that each of the two rods makes to the total sound. Now let's take a look at the hammers. Here we have the inside of octave 5, the highest octave. So these little rods don't even have stabilizers. They're very, very short. I put a penny in there to give you a sense of scale. And interestingly, if you look at the top of the uh, shorter rods, the final tuning has been accomplished not with a collar, but by a, adding a little drop of solder just to get it to the right length. Now we're looking at the lowest octave. These are quite tall and there are stabilizers at various points along the rods. You can see the tuning weights very clearly there. And the striker is way down at the bottom. As you can see, there's a lot going on inside those cabinets, clearly the result of thoughtful research and clever design. Undoubtedly, that's the reason these instruments were so successful for four decades. I hope you've enjoyed this video tour of the Flemish Bells and found it informative. I look forward to sharing future videos with you. If you're enjoying these videos, please consider subscribing to my channel. Thanks for watching.